Let's talk about glial cells. They're the other brain cells. We have neurons, but then we have these supportive cells called glial cells. And the star of the show is astrocytes, and we'll get to the other glial cells after that. But astrocytes play a key role in the blood-brain barrier. So there's a lot of things in our blood that we don't want in our brain that could be toxic to our brain. And so uh, astrocytes play a role here. If we look at the interface between the blood and the brain, if this is a capillary or blood vessel, we have the endothelial cells that line the blood vessel. And in the blood-brain barrier, they also have tight junctions to make it where things can't slip in between them. And then outside of the endothelial cells, we have the basal lamina, which is connective tissue. And then right outside of that is where these astrocytes tend to accumulate. And they have these foot processes that add another barrier to the blood-brain barrier. And then another role that they play is they actually express a protein called growth factors that then move into the endothelial cells and act as a transcription factor to increase expression of these little proteins called tight junctions to make sure that's a good secure uh, barrier there. So that's two ways astrocytes work on the blood-brain barrier, just kind of a physical barrier with these foot processes and then indirectly through sending growth factors over to increase the number of tight junctions. So astrocytes have other functions. One is that they'll modulate how much neurotransmitter is out and about. So for example, if this is a neuron communicating with this neuron, the two primary neurotransmitters we see in the brain are the excitatory glutamate and the inhibitory GABA and GABA is made from glutamate. It's called gamma aminobutyric acid. And so these two neurotransmitters, if either one of these are released into the synaptic cleft, they're out there transiently. Some of it binds to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, but then we want to make sure that's not left out there too long, and we want to make sure not too much of it is out there. You know, if you had too much glutamate out there, it could cause neurotoxicity or excitability. Um, so the astrocyte actually has transporters that will transport GABA and or glutamate back into the astrocyte. The astrocyte then has an enzyme there called glutamine synthetase that will take that GABA or the glutamate and eventually get it back to glutamine. And then glutamine is a precursor to both of these. So once glutamine is made in the astrocyte, then it can be taken back up into the neuron. And in the neuron, there's enzymes that can convert it back to either glutamate or GABA. So all that to say, the astrocytes kind of um, monitor the neurotransmitters and help with that. Another thing is they can use these foot processes and there may be a neuron right here and they could tether that neuron close to a capillary to make sure it's close to blood supply and glucose. So that's another thing it can do. Another one is that when there's activity in neurons, you know, you have the action potential and then you have repolarization. And a key ion in the repolarization is potassium. So sometimes you can have a lot of too much potassium out here and that can throw off the whole neural electrical activity. So it's good that they can mop up this potassium, get it into the astrocyte and then um, they can kind of store it there. And then if, if needed, they can release it back, but uh, at least they get, kind of get it out so that it's not causing issues. Another thing is just when a neuron's at rest, the potassium channels are leaky and you can have excess potassium kind of leak out and it can kind of help just monitor that and mop it up and just make sure that there's not too much potassium out there. Because we know potassium is higher intracellularly, so we don't want a lot outside the cell that would throw everything off. And then one more role of the astrocyte is when glucose is coming into our bloodstream through the capillary, <clears throat> it goes through a, a GLUT1 transporter and then it can come in and, you know, it can go to a neuron and go through a, gl gl a GLUT3 transporter and get into the neuron directly. Or um, astrocytes can take in the glucose and store it as glycogen. You know, you think of the liver and muscle as storing glycogen, but in the brain, the astrocytes play a key role in storing glycogen. And then if the astrocyte senses that ATP is low, 
it can then take that glycogen and break it down from glucose to pyruvate and then to the lactate. And so it can take that and make lactate out of that glucose. And then the lactate can be released from the astrocyte and go to the neuron where it needs the, the energy source. And so it'll take in the lactate and then the neuron can take lactate, go back to pyruvate. They're both three carbon molecules. And then the pyruvate can enter the Krebs cycle and go through and make ATP eventually. So um, that's astrocytes. Let's recap what astro astrocytes do. One, they provide a, a key role in the blood-brain barrier by the barrier of the foot processes, releasing growth factors to increase the tight junctions, which are proteins. Another thing they do is they uh, take X, um, glutamate and GABA, which are neurotransmitters, and they can take them in um, and make sure they're not out there in the synaptic cleft too long or out in the extracellular environment too long. They'll take it back in, convert them to glutamate, which is a precursor to both of them. The, excuse me, the glutamine. So they, they take GABA and glutamate and take them to glutamine in the astrocyte. And then uh, the neuron can take the glutamine back up. And if it's a glutaminergic neuron, it'll make more glutamine or glutamate. And if it's a, a GABAergic neuron, it'll make more GABA. So um, let's, let's go through that individually because I kind of got some words mixed up. So GABA, the primary inhibitory neurotransporter, it'll be taken up by the astrocyte and converted to glutamine, and then it'll go back to the neuron and get converted back to GABA, recycled. If it's glutamate, an excitatory synapse, glutamate can be taken into the astrocyte, converted as well to glutamine, and then glutamine can be taken up by the glutaminergic neuron and converted back to glutamate and recycled that way. So that's another one. Uh, another function, again, is the uh, potassium, whether it's repolarization or the leaky potassium channels. It can be an excess ex outside the neuron. This isn't a good thing. This can throw off the neuron activity. So the potassium gets mopped up by the astrocyte and taken out of that um, extracellular environment. And then uh, as far as uh, nutrient metabolism, it can take glucose in, convert that glucose to glycogen. When energy levels are low in the brain, it can actually take the glycogen, break it from off the glycogen tree to glucose, and then glucose can be uh, go through some enzymatic steps until it reaches lactate. Once lactate is achieved, lactate can be released and lactate can be taken up by the neuron in a neuron shuttle, and then the uh, lactate can be converted in the neuron to pyruvate and then be used to make ATP. So lots going on with the astrocyte. The other glial cells are a lot easier. So let's look at those. Satellite cells, these are in the peripheral nervous system. So astrocytes are only in the central nervous system, only in the brain and spinal cord. Satellite cells are only out in the peripheral nervous system at ganglia. Remember, the, the definition of a nucleus in the brain is a group of cell bodies in the central nervous system. But we can also have a group of cell bodies outside the central nervous system, you know, uh, related to a nerve. And those are called ganglia, ganglia. And so at these ganglia where we have these groups of neurons out in the peripheral nervous system, satellite cells play the same role as astrocytes. <clears throat> so they play a role with nutrient metabolism with glucose. Uh, they mop up any excess potassium and they regulate the neurotransmitters and you know recycle those so that's satellite cells microglia think of these as immune cells of the central nervous system so they're only in the brain and spinal cord and if you had some kind of pathogen in the brain imagine some kind of bacteria actually gets into the brain um, they can help by phagocytosing the bacteria so microglia are derived from monocytes Monocytes, you know, other places become macrophages when they go out in the tissues, but in the brain, they, they get they differentiate into microglial cells, which are also phagocytic, so they can eat up these bacteria, and then they can, they're anti antigen-presenting cells, so they can put that bacteria in their major histocompatibility type 2 complex, their MHC type 2 complex on their membrane, and present that uh, antigen to T cells and get the immune system going and helping to fight off those pathogens. 
but sometimes microglial cells can add to the damage. If you had some kind of brain injury, maybe let's say it was ischemic brain injury where you had a, a stroke, then um, they may when, uh, um, start releasing nitric oxide, reaction oxygen species and cytokines. These things are good when you're fighting off bacteria, but not so good when you already have inflammation and you're just adding more inflammation to it and it can cause even more tissue damage. So microglia, immune cells in the central nervous system. <clears throat> okay, so myelin is, is provided by two types of cells. One is swan cells that are in the peripheral nervous system and one is oligodendrocytes. So swan cells, um, there's only one per axon and then there's multiple swan cells that make up the myelin in the peripheral nervous system. But with the oligodendrocytes, they, they can have several arms, 30 to 60 arms that go out and provide myelin to several different axons. The key thing I want you to remember about these are that they, um, that swan cells are in the peripheral nervous system, oligodendrocytes are in the central nervous system. Another thing I want you to remember is that when swan cells get demyelinated, like Guillain-Barre syndrome, they can regenerate. So you can recover fully after having Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, whereas oligodendrocytes, when they get damaged, such as multiple sclerosis, they can't regenerate. So um, that damage is there for good. And um, that's a key distinction that I want you to know. But myelin just helps speed up the electrical potential down those long axons. The last glial cell is ependymal cells. These line our ventricles. And our, so, um, you know, we have cerebral spinal fluid in our brain. We have the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, the fourth ventricle. We have a little hole in the center of our spinal cord called the central canal where spinal fluid flows. Lining all that pathway <clears throat> are ependymal cells and they're cuboid shaped and they're ciliated. So they have several functions. So they just play a role in the blood CSF barrier. So the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier, they play a role in that. Just like we have a blood brain barrier, we have a blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier and it's picky too. So if you can imagine these cuboid shaped ependymal cells lining the ventricles, they actually have tight junctions as well that hold one to the one uh, ependymal cell to the next. And so um, there's a lot of things that are in the blood that doesn't get in our cerebrospinal fluid and including red blood cells. So our blood's red and our cerebral spinal fluid is clear. And then it also plays a role in making the cerebral spinal fluid as well as circulating the cerebral spinal fluid. So remember I said on the pentamal cells, on the side facing the actual cerebral spinal fluid is where the cilia are located on the actual cuboid shaped cell. And it'll, it'll beat and flow that cerebral spinal fluid. Um, so that's the different um, glial cells. The only two that we find in our peripheral nervous system are satellite cells that are basically the astrocytes of the um, peripheral nervous system and Schwann cells which provide the myelin and can regenerate in the peripheral nervous system. All the other ones, ependymal cells, microglial cells, astrocytes, uh, oligodendrocytes, these are found in the central nervous system. <clears throat> So astrocyte gets its name from, it's a star-shaped cell. So if you looked at it under a microscope, it would kind of have a star-shaped appearance. But uh, it, it by far has the most functions and is very important. All of these are very important. So um, I hope that helps you understand a little bit about glial cells.